Hi, I'm Pranav and this video will be about the western blot. There are four major types of blots, the western blot for proteins, the southern blot for DNA, the northern blot for RNA, and the eastern blot for protein post-translational modifications. The western and southern blots are the most used type of blot for research. In a western blot, proteins are extracted from a sample, quantified for total protein concentrations, and then loaded on a gel for electrophoresis which separates the proteins based on size. Then, the gel is transferred to a longer-lasting membrane, or a blot. This blot can then be probed and imaged to look for the presence of certain proteins. Western blotting is important in research as it shows which genes in a sample are upregulated or downregulated after different treatments. This is really important to finding out the function of different drugs and cell pathways. The first step in the western blot process is to prepare the sample, which is usually a cell or tissue culture. If the sample is a tissue, you need to first homogenize the tissue or break it down into individual cells. This could be done with a bead mill. After this step, the rest of the steps need to be performed in 4 degrees Celsius. The homogenized cells are then washed with PBS or phosphate buffered saline which helps maintain the constant pH of 7.4 and is isotonic to the cells. The next step is to lyse the cells using lysis buffer. After lysis buffer is added to the cells, the cells are rotated at 4 degrees Celsius for about 30 minutes before being centrifuged. After centrifuging the cells with lysis buffer, the supernatant, or the liquid at the top of the vial, is collected into a fresh vial. This supernatant contains the proteins of the cell and will be used for the BCA assay in the blot. Meanwhile, the pellet, or the solid clump at the bottom of the vial, is discarded since it's just cell debris. The next part of the western blot process is the BCA assay, or the bisincondinic acid assay. This is an important step in the western blot since all the western blot wells must be filled with an equal concentration of total proteins. If the protein concentrations were unequal across samples in the gel, then you wouldn't be able to compare between the samples. The BCA plate shown in the image is read by a machine which interprets the purple color intensity of the sample wells. The darker purple the well is, the more protein concentration it has. The first step in performing the BCA assay is to make the standards. This is done by performing an 8-step serial dilution of BSA or bovine serum albumin. BSA has a known protein concentration value, so the color of these standards can be used to pinpoint the protein concentrations of the samples. The first vial starts with 80 microliters of BSA. Then, 40 microliters are transferred from vial 1 to vial 2, which contains 40 microliters of lysis buffer. 40 microliters of this 50% solution is then transferred to vial 3, this continues for the rest of the vials. These standards are then added onto a well plate with 10 microliters per well and then triplicate. The next step is to add 10 microliters of each sample onto the well plate in triplicate. Then add 196 microliters of BCA reagent A and 4 microliters of BCA reagent B onto each sample on the well plate. Usually, a large stock quantity of a reagent A and reagent B solution is created beforehand and then added onto all the samples simultaneously, which streamlines the process a bit. The next step is to take the plate and put it on a plate mixer to remove any bubbles, and then transfer the plate to a bacteriological incubator for 20 to 30 minutes. Finally, you can then read the results and calculate how much of each sample to load on the gel. The next part of the western blot process is the gel electrophoresis. If you want to separate the proteins based on their size, you would run an SDS page or a sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. The chemicals in the polyacrylamide gel of the SDS page destroys the proteins' secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures and gives all the proteins a uniform ratio of negative charge to mass. This way, the movement of the proteins down the gel would be based only on the polypeptide size. The smaller polypeptides would move further down the gel than the larger polypeptides. Before loading the samples on a gel, a 2x loading buffer and a tracking dye needs to be added into each sample, and the proteins need to be denatured by heating at 95 to 100 degrees Celsius for 5 minutes. 
Then, place the polyacrylamide gel vertically into the center slot of the western blot box and fill the area around the gel with the running buffer. The next step is to add the samples into the wells at the top of the gel using a micropipette. The amount of each sample added should be based on the protein concentrations and should range from 20 to 30 microliters. You should also load the standards into a well since it will give a set of known protein sizes to compare the samples to. Finally, you can connect the wires to the anode and cathode and run the gel for 1 to 2 hours at about 100 volts. As you can see in the picture, samples are loaded into the wells at the top of the gel with a micropipette. There's running buffer around the gel and the gel is connected to a power source. The anode actually connects to the bottom of the gel, not to the side of the gel. After running the gel, the proteins are going to travel down the gel and create distinct bands as seen here. The next part of the western blot process is the actual blotting process. You can either use nitrocellulose paper or PVDF for your membrane. PVDF, or polyvinylidene difluoride, is more stable and used more often. The first step in blotting is to remove and trim the polyacrylamide gel and soak it in transfer buffer for 10 to 30 minutes. The second step is to activate the PVDF membrane by soaking it in methanol for one minute and then soaking it in transfer buffer. You also need to soak the sponge and filter papers in transfer buffer. Then, place all the materials in order shown in this diagram. The black anode and the red cathode can usually attach to each other, squeezing all the layers in between tightly together. Then, this is connected to a power source for around 1-2 to two hours. Since the proteins are negatively charged on the SDS page, the proteins travel towards the positive charge and thus travel from the gel onto the membrane. The next part of the western blot process is probing for the proteins with antibodies. The antibodies will bind to and detect the presence of specific proteins you are looking for. First, the membrane is put in a blocking buffer overnight, which prevents any antibodies from binding to the membrane non-specifically. Then, wash the membrane in the primary antibody overnight and then rinse off the primary antibody with three washes with TBSC buffer. Next. Wash the membrane in the secondary antibody for an hour, followed by three washes with TBST buffer. The primary antibody is specific to a single protein and attaches to that protein on the blood. The secondary antibody attaches to the primary antibody. The secondary antibody has a label attached, which can be detected with chemiluminescent or fluorescent imaging. This antibody probing could be repeated multiple times with different antibodies that target the different proteins you are interested in. Different secondary antibody labels can be detected with different methods. One method is to use fluorescent imaging. Another method is to use a radioactive isotope as a label and use autoradiography to detect the radiation. A third method is to use gold conjugation where proteins accumulate gold atoms and stain dark red. A fourth method, which is the most used, is chemiluminescence, where the enzyme label HRP on the second antibody reacts with luminol peroxide to create luminol, which releases light. This light is usually imaged using a western blot membrane reader, such as Chemidoc. The picture on the right shows a membrane that is submerged in TBSD buffer. When not using the membrane, be sure not to let the membrane dry up by keeping it in TBSD buffer on an automatic shaker. Before imaging the membrane, the bands of the proteins that were marked by the chemiluminescence antibodies are usually not visible to the naked eye. Only the standards ladder can be seen with the naked eye. This picture on the left shows an example of a membrane after imaging. In this example, the membrane was probed for KRAS, which is an oncogene that could lead to various carcinomas if mutated. On the left of the blot, you can see the standards ladder, which correlates to the size of the proteins in kilodaltons or KDA. The much darker band in the first column signifies an upregulation of KRAS, meaning there is more of the KRAS protein in the first sample compared to the other samples. The picture on the right shows several western blot images compiled together to show different expressions of certain proteins when RAS is mutated or overexpressed. You can see that BRAF, PhosphoMEC, and PhosphoERC are upregulated in the mutant RAS sample, while ERC and MEC are not. 
The explanation for this upregulation is that BRAF, phospho-MEK, and phospho-ERK are downstream of RAS in the cell signaling pathway. In other words, an overexpression of RAS stimulates the overexpression of these three proteins as part of its signaling pathway. The gap TH band at the bottom of the block is a housekeeping gene. A housekeeping gene is a gene that is constantly highly expressed in all cells, no matter what treatment the cells undergo. They are usually structural genes that are always present in any cell or are always required for cell function. Other common housekeeping genes are alpha-tubulin, beta-actin, vinculin, and HSP60. Imaging for a housekeeping gene is necessary when analyzing a western blot to act as a positive control and show that both samples have the same total protein concentration, which removes bias from the experiment. Here are a couple resources you can use to learn more about the western blot. You can look into Abcam's and Sigma Allergist protocols if you want to perform a western blot. You can use the Protein Atlas link for more explanations of the western blot. Cell signaling technology can be used to study the antibodies needed for your experiment or learn about the signaling pathway of a specific protein. You can use the NCBI NIH GenBank database to search up basically any molecule of interest. For example, you can learn more about a specific gene or a protein on the database.